Okay, well, a very warm welcome to this site. It's now our third study in the, the second Tuesday series entitled Introducing the, the Minor Prophets. And today we're going to be looking at the Book of Amos. And it's, it's great to, uh, that you're all able to, to join us. As usual, I just wanted to start off by letting you know what we're going to be doing over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, firstly, I'm going to open in prayer, after which uh, Sylvia is going to start us off with the roughly the first half of the book of Amos, the judgment on the nations in Israel. Um, then I'll follow with a, a few quick comments before Mike finishes off the book of, of Amos with the, roughly the second half looking at Israel's destruction and restoration. And then finally, uh, Willie will give some comments before closing in prayer and then detailing some OBT uh, resources on this subject and letting you know about the future upcoming sessions for the OBT. And then at the end, as, as normal, we'll have some time for questions and, and comments. So I'll just quickly open in prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, once again, we, we thank you for being able to, to be together this evening, for the privilege of being able to, to study your word, uh, to hear your word expounded, and, and just to, to talk with each other and have fellowship with each other. Um, although the book that we will be studying was written well over two and a half thousand years ago, we ask that what we will hear this evening will be meaningful to us today, and that it would resonate with us and that we would be able to learn from it. I ask, Lord, that you'd be with Mike and Sylvia as they speak and that you would richly bless our short time together this evening. And we ask all these things in and through the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So now we're going to uh, start off with Sylvia. Thank you. OK. So background to the book of Amos. Now, last month, we looked at the prophet Jonah, who prophesied to Nineveh, the greatest city in Assyria at that time. And this month, we're going to look at the prophet Amos, who prophesied at the same time as Jonah, around 760 BC. But the focus of Amos was the northern kingdom of Israel, when Jeroboam II was their king. Humanly speaking, Israel did very well under Jeroboam II. Under him, they became extremely prosperous, and they were proud of his military prowess and achievements, which led to their prosperity. However, last month, we also heard that this was because it was the Lord who saved Israel through Jeroboam, as also prophesied by Jonah, because the Lord had had compassion on their suffering. In fact, Jeroboam II was the longest reigning king of the northern kingdom of Israel. He reigned for 41 years, so one year longer even than Solomon. And he managed to extend the borders of Israel back to those that were achieved by Solomon in his heyday, about 200 years earlier. And so by the middle of his reign, many in Israel were very self-satisfied self and very wealthy, and they lived in luxury. So after 20 years of living well, they had no reason to believe that this wouldn't continue into the distant future. And yet from history, we know that they had less than 40 years left before Israel would be defeated by Assyria and carted off into captivity in 722 BC. They had seemingly forgotten that their prosperity was due to the Lord, and not Jeroboam. And so in the middle of Jeroboam the second's reign, Amos prophesied to Israel and warned them of what would happen if they didn't change their ways. 2 Kings 14 verses 23 to 29 actually summarizes Jeroboam II's long reign in seven short verses. And verse 24 introduces this summary by saying, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, of whom the Lord had said that he had done more evil than all who had lived before him. So he was a pretty bad guy. He'd been a shameless idolater, setting up not just one, but two golden calves for the people to worship, building pagan shrines throughout Israel, installing priests who were not Levites, and making up his own religious rules in contradiction to those of the Lord. And that's all recorded in 1 Kings 12 verses 25 to 33. 
Today, it's easy for people to believe, just like Israel did back then, that after living with plenty of food and clothing and housing and enjoying relative peace for 20 years, that there's no need to keep to the Lord's commands when everything is going so well. And certainly in our westernized democracies, where much of the time we live in peace and prosperity, people see less and less need for God in keeping his commands, as materialistically, they have everything that they need, and in many cases, much more besides. It's only when wars loom on the horizon that people sometimes start turning back to God, as in the Second World War, when churches were filled with far more people than they had prior to this. Many centuries after Amos wrote this book, the Apostle Paul instructed Timothy to command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. It's 1 Timothy 6 verse 17. However, not only was this good advice for those in the New Testament, it would have been good advice for those in Amos's day. And indeed, it's good for many of us today too. It's clear that people throughout history show the same failings time and time again. And then on to slide four. So the very first verse of the book of Amos begins by telling us who Amos was and where he came from. He was a shepherd from Tekoa, which was a village south of Jerusalem. However, although he came from the southern kingdom of Judah, he was called by the Lord to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel. On both counts, this is unusual. First, he was a working man, presumably of lowly origin. And second, he was sent out from his familiar surroundings to prophesy to wealthy landowners and priests who lived in the northern kingdom of Israel. In verse two, the prophecies are introduced by Amos saying, the Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. And this is repeated by Amos in 3.8, which says, the lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? The lion of Judah is a figure which is used first in Genesis and finally in Revelation. And it refers to the Messiah, the Christ, the son of God. So where it's first used in Genesis 49, verses 9 to 10, it says that Judah is a lion's cub and that the scepter will not depart from Judah until it comes to him to whom it belongs, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Revelation 5, verses 5 to 6, it says, see the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And so by using this figure of the lion, Amos clearly states his credentials, that his prophecy is not his own, it's from the Lord himself. And also by saying he roars and thunders, he immediately makes it clear that the Lord is angry. Slide five. Then Amos passes on to the detailed judgments that would fall on Israel's neighbors in Amos 1, three to two, five. Now there's seven heirs, areas that are mentioned in total. And if you looked at those on a map at the time of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, you'll see that these seven totally surrounded the kingdom of Israel. So the seven places prophesied against are firstly Damascus in Syria, which is to the north of Israel. Secondly, Gaza in the land of the Philistines to the west of Israel. And then thirdly, we've got Tyre in Phoenicia, that's modern Lebanon, to the northwest of Israel. And then fourthly, there's Edom, that's south of the Dead Sea, and that's modern Jordan, and that's to the south of Israel. And then fifthly, we've got Ammon to the northeast of the Dead Sea, that's modern Jordan again, to the east of Israel. And sixthly, we've got Moab, which is directly east of the Dead Sea, and again, that's modern Jordan, and that's to the east of Israel. And then finally, and the seventh one is Judah, which is directly south of Israel. Now, each of these seven prophecies is introduced by the same words. For example, the first one is, for three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. And so on through the seven places. The last one being Judah, which is the southern kingdom, as it was known at that time. 
For each place, this introductory sentence is then followed by the specific wrong that they had done and then what the specific resulting judgment would be. And each of these mainly consisted of the destruction of their fortresses and in some cases, the death of their kings and leaders. And then slide six. So these seven prophecies finally lead up to the judgment of Israel in chapter two, verses six to 16. And this new section is introduced by the same words as the previous seven prophecies. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. However, the details given for Israel are far more comprehensive and serve as an introduction to the rest of the book of Amos, which focuses on Israel and their failings and their future judgment. So up to this point in the prophecy, they would have been happy to have heard about the condemnation of all their neighbors surrounding them. But from this point on, when his focus turns onto them, no doubt this attitude would have rapidly changed. To begin with, in verses six, seven, and eight, they are totally condemned by the following words. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and they deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. So these words speak for themselves. They seem to have no shame in their appalling conduct and seem to have forgotten or simply ignored many of the Lord's commands regarding behavior. Much of what's said here seems to be condemning particularly those who are rich and powerful and in positions of authority. These leaders are corrupt and pass verdicts in favor of those who can pay them the most and they're greedy for money and they treat the poor like dirt. They're not worried about justice for those people who are wronged. And also they indulged in shameless sexual immorality and they carelessly drank wine obtained by using the fines that they extracted. And by doing this, they profaned God's holy name as much of this behavior was a direct imitation of those who lived around them. And that's the Canaanites who did these things in their pagan religious practices when they worshiped Baal. So rather than the Canaanites following Israel with purity, it was the other way around. They did the same as these pagans. What an indictment on these people. No wonder the Lord was angry with them. No wonder Amos said that the Lord roared and thundered at them. And then slide seven. The next few verses go on to remind Israel of what the Lord had done for them in the past, how he had destroyed the Amorites who had lived in the land before them, and how he brought them out of slavery in Egypt in the first place. In this way, he'd made them into a free nation and he'd given them a land of their own to live in. No doubt the Lord wanted them to be thankful for this and to show this in the way that they lived. And not only this, he reminded them that he had given them the prophets to show them the way to continue the work that was begun by Moses in the wilderness when he set up the entire religious framework for the nation of Israel and the ways in which they were to worship the one God, Yahweh. He also mentions the rules that have been set up for those who wanted to set themselves apart and dedicate themselves to God as Nazarites. All the many details of how they could do this are set out in Numbers chapter 6. And among other things, Nazarites vowed not to eat or drink any grape products, which therefore prevented them from drinking wine. But now the Lord declared they didn't want to listen to the prophets and they didn't want the people to dedicate themselves to the Lord anymore. The leaders told the prophets not to prophesy and they made the Nazarites drink wine. And as a result, Amos describes the judgment that will fall upon Israel. In picturesque language, he declares that they will be crushed like a cart crushes everything beneath, beneath it when it's loaded with grain. And as the New Bible Commentary puts it, so Israel is heaping up a weight of divine wrath which will press the nation into helpless destruction. No one will escape, not the swift, nor the strong, not the warrior, nor the archer, not the soldier nor the horseman will flee in that day 
declares the Lord. All this in these first two chapters of Amos is just the beginning of what Amos has to say in his prophecy against Israel. And then slide eight. Chapter three of Amos begins in verse one with the words, hear this word, the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. So Amos makes it clear to start with that these are not his own words, they're the words of the Lord himself. And then in verse two, the Lord states that privilege goes hand in hand with responsibility. You can't have one without the other. He chose Israel out of all the families on earth. And this in fact include, also includes the kingdom of Judah. And consequently, he will punish them for all their sins. Now today, people talk a lot about their rights, what they're entitled to and what they should have. Much less is said about the responsibilities that go in hand in hand with having these rights. And similarly, Israel was very happy when the Lord selected them as a chosen nation and protected them. But they weren't so happy when he required them to keep his commands and punish them if they didn't. And then verses three to six give six examples of cause and effect, the things that naturally follow on one from another as sure as night follows day. And it culminates in saying at the end of verse six, when disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? A rhetorical question demanding the answer, yes. When Israel behaved in a certain way, the Lord would respond. And this is the whole message of the law of Moses, which is epitomized in Deuteronomy 28. If Israel kept the law, they would be blessed. If they didn't, they would be judged. And here they're reminded of this. And then verse seven also reminds them that although they will be judged, they will also be given plenty of warning in advance. The Lord reveals his plans in advance to the prophets so that the people are without any excuse. They can never argue that they didn't know what was coming and that their judgment wasn't fair. And in fact, they're told not only that their judgment is coming, but they're also told why it's coming. They have time to change their ways and avoid judgment if they wish as Nineveh did at the preaching of Jonah, as we heard in our previous study. And then in verse eight, we have the figure of the lion roaring again, as mentioned earlier. This verse says, the lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? Amos cannot help but prophesy because the Lord has spoken and is angry with his chosen people. And then in verses 9 and 10, the Lord calls for the heathens in Ashdod and Egypt to look at what's going on in Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. They were hoarding ill-gotten gains and plunder and indulged in wrongdoing so much so that they no longer knew how to do right, the Lord declares. The Apostle Paul talks about a person's conscience being seared like a hot iron, that's in 1 Timothy 4 verse 2, so that they can no longer see that what they're doing is morally wrong. And it seems that Israel as a nation had actually reached this point such that even the pagans around would look at them in astonishment at what they were doing. The rest of the chapter in verses 11 to 15 records what the Lord would do as a result of this. An enemy would overrun the land and hardly anything would remain. The properties of the wealthy, their winter and summer houses and mansions adorned with ivory, they would all be demolished. However, it wasn't so much the wealth that Amos condemned, rather than the unscrupulous ways it was, it was gained. And the altars of Bethel would be destroyed and fall to the ground. Sadly, Bethel was the center of idolatrous worship in Israel by, the time, by this time in history. It was in fact one of the two places where Jer Jeroboam I had placed a golden calf. Whereas once it had been known as the gate of heaven, and that's in Genesis 28 verse 17. And that's where Jacob, Jacob had his dream of a stairway of heaven with angels of God ascending and descending on it. That was Bethel too sad degeneration after that. And then slide nine. Chapter four of Amos starts with, 
hear this word, the same three words as he used at the start of chapter three. And again, this is the word of the Lord. And this time he addresses the women of Israel. And he says this, hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. This isn't, certainly isn't very flattering of the women of Israel to say the least, but there was nothing to praise when these women did the opposite of what the Lord wanted. Instead of helping the poor and needy, they oppressed them. They were lazy and they ordered their husbands to bring them their drinks. The Lord likened them to the cows of Bashan who were fat and well fed on the pastures east of the Jordan. These women were no doubt wealthy and there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. As I said, what is wrong is what the rich do with their wealth. These women were self-indulgent and lazy. Some of the description here sounds very much like our modern society where a fair proportion are wealthy. But if the wealth is channeled into good causes and it's used to benefit others in society, the poor, the sick and the marginalized, this is what pleases the Lord as Paul mentions in the New Testament in 1 Timothy 6 verse 18. In verses two and three, the Lord says that they will be taken away with hooks and cast out of the city in judgment for their attitude. And in verse four, he refers to them boasting about their sacrifices and tithes and thank offerings and free will offerings. But these actually made no difference to the Lord. They were simply going through religious rituals and they gave out of their wealth to the priests rather than to the poor. Their behavior was sinful and they didn't obey the moral law of Moses. And then following this, there's five short passages, each ending with, yet you have not returned to me. The Lord had done various things to make them return to him and do his will. He'd sent famines, he'd withheld rain, he'd struck their gardens and vineyards with blight and mildew, he'd sent plagues, and he had had them defeated in battle and yet it made no difference. Perhaps they simply dismissed these as natural disasters or unfortunate events. But the fact was none of this made any difference to the way that they lived. As a result, they were going to be judged. And the last verse in chapter four, describing the Lord God Almighty is beautifully expressed. It says, he who forms the mountains, creates the wind and reveals his thoughts to man. He who turns dawn to darkness, and treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. And this verse makes clear the omnipotence and the omniscience of the Lord God Almighty, who is all powerful and all knowing and sovereign over everything visible, that's the mountains, and everything invisible, the wind, and everything that can be known. He has absolute and complete control. And as this is so, it should have been absolutely clear to Israel that their dismissal of him was futile and that turning their backs on his warnings of future judgment and destruction was ill-advised, to say the least. Then slide 10. For the third time in Amos, at the beginning of chapter five, he starts with the same three words. Hear this word. Verse one says, hear this word, O Israel, this lament I take up concerning you. And as at the beginning of chapter three, Amos addresses this lament to the house of Israel. However, he intersperses this lament with hope for the future. If only they will seek the Lord and live, as it says in verses four and six, and seek good, not evil, in verses 14 and 15. Many times when doom is prophesied in the Old Testament and future judgment is threatened, the Lord shows the way out. And it always begins with repentance. In verses 14 and 15, this is made clear where it says, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. However, if they do not repent, judgment will fall on them. Verse two speaks of Israel falling, never to rise again. And verse three of only 100 out of a thousand surviving. That is 90% were going to die. And verses 16 and 17 
speak of wailing the streets, anguish in the public squares, farmers weeping and mourners wailing in the vineyards. To avoid all of this, all they had to do was to repent. What did they have to repent of? This chapter gives us many details here. They ignore righteousness. They despise those who tell the truth. They trample on the poor. They take bribes and they deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Sadly, in the middle of all of this, verse 13 says that the prudent man keeps quiet in such times for the times are evil. It's often attributed to Edmund Burke that he said in the mid 19th century that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And it was the same in Amos's day. Unfortunately, we know from history that they didn't listen to the prophets and they didn't repent. And that as a result, less than 40 years later, that's using the New Bible commentary dating, that the Northern Kingdom of Israel fell to Assyria. And then slide 11. Lastly, in the middle of this se section, in chapter five, verses one to 17, there's two verses, that's verses eight and nine, that again describe the infinite power of the Lord God Almighty. Like the verse at the end of chapter four, these two verses are again beautifully expressed. He who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns blackness into dawn and darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land, the Lord is his name. He flashes destruction on the stronghold and brings the fortified city to ruin. These verses seem almost out of place here in the middle of a section that describes the injustice and wrongdoing of the wealthy leaders in the Northern Kingdom of Israel. However, maybe by doing this, they accentuate the great and infinite power of the Lord God Almighty in comparison to these people who thought that they were powerful and influential and indeed trusted in their wealth and position rather than in the Lord. And so by this, the contrast is striking. And then from verse 18 of chapter 5, Amos starts a new section where he talks about the first of two woes to come on the people, the second being at the beginning of chapter 6. And so I'm going to finish here and I'm going to let Mike continue with the two woes in the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia. That, that was excellent. Um, as so was already mentioned a month ago, when, when I started off looking at the uh, Jonah in this series, we, we saw that uh, Jonah had prophesied that King Jeroboam II of the Northern Kingdom of Israel was going to have military successes, that their borders would be extended. However, as we saw in God's eyes, he was one of the worst kings ever. All those victories had generated new territories and wealth, but that didn't lead to praise and thankfulness to God instead to apathy and idol worship. And then that in turn led to injustice and the neglect of the poor in Israel. So God had miraculously rescued the people of Israel from slavery, oppression and injustice in Egypt. But now the wealthier portion of Israel was inflicting that same slavery, oppression and injustice on their own fellow Jews. So we, we can understand why God was so righteously angry and why Amos was sent to make that message clear and to issue a call to repentance. So now it's time for us to hear from Mike, and he's going to go through the, the rest of the book of Amos. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Now, one thing we should note about not just Amos, but about the minor prophets, some of the minor prophets' words, some of what they said are the local fulfillment or a near time fulfillment. However, some relate to events that are still future to us and will take place in the years just before when the Lord returns and sets up his earthly kingdom. So sometimes it's a skill or a difficulty sometimes to decide whether this uh, sentence or judgment, is it relating to, you know, a few years time from when it was given or in the very distant future. Now, this is epitomized by the expression, the day of the Lord, which Amos chapter 5, 18 has, the day of the Lord. And this expression is often misunderstood. I mean, 
I was reading in a book uh, when I was preparing for these studies. And this a theologian says, in Amos, the day of the Lord is to be a day of light and brightness. And I've got three question marks there because I question that. And I can remember some years ago sitting in church and hearing a sermon and he picked one, two. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And the preacher said the day of the Lord was the return of Christ. And again, I would put, I should have put three question marks there. Slide 14, please. So let us look at the context a bit more. In Amos chapter 5, 18 to 19, you can see it's not a day of brightness and rejoicing. Look what it says. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall, only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light? Pitch dark, without a ray of brightness. That's what Amos says about the day of the Lord. And if you look at the next verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, well, let's read verse 2 again and verse 3. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly and they will not escape. So the day of the Lord is always to do with judgment. It's always to do with judgment. And here in Thessalonians, what it's talking about is that end time prophecy. If you remember this uh, king of the north, this Satan's man, this Antichrist is going to make a seven year agreement with Israel so they can have their sacrifices in their temple. And the first three and a half years is peace. And so Israel will be saying peace and safety. But at that halfway point, after that three and a half years, he comes in and, well, what does he do? He sets an image of himself up in the temple and makes the Jews bow down and worship it. And if they didn't, they would be beheaded. So when you see this expression, the day of the Lord, don't look at it and think, oh, it's the day Christ returns. This is fantastic. No, it's not. It's referring to a period of time of judgment. Slide 15, please. Now, but the question is, in Amos and in other places, is he referring to the day of the Lord or is it a day of the Lord? That's, that's a, you may ask why I'm saying that. Well, in this particular passage in the Hebrew codices, some of those codices have the word the put in and some don't have it put in. In other words, it referring to a day of the Lord. So it looks like that some of the um, Hebrew scholars and copiers weren't quite certain what to put there themselves. But anyway, my understanding, and I've written this book, The Day of the Lord, when, and it goes right through looking at every single reference to the day of the Lord in the Old Testament and the new, and determining whether it's a, a near fulfillment or a distant fulfillment related to Christ's second coming. And so I personally prefer to refer to the day of the Lord as the great tribulation or the great distress in Matthew 24, 21. That period covering the three and a half years before Christ returns. You may remember in Matthew 24 is introduced with the words, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel set up in the holy place, then flee in those in Jerusalem, Judea, flee into the mountains. And that's then this three and a half year terrible time, which I refer to as the day of the Lord. However, throughout Israel's history, there have been a number of a day of the Lord, if you like. There's been a number of times of judgment and suffering which God has inflicted on them and warned them about. Number 16, please. So is Amos talking about the distance, the day of the Lord, or is he talking about a nearer, a day of the Lord? Well, I think he's talking about a nearer, a day of the Lord. Remember what the Sylvia quoted from the New Bible Commentary. Israel is heaping up a weight of divine wrath which will press the nation into helpless destruction. 
And this is what we read. If you read Amos 5, 21 to 26, you'll see why. Um, you'll see what the Lord says about Israel and what they're doing and their deficiencies and their sins. But note verse 27, therefore I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. So there's the a day of the Lord. There's the consequences to be sent into exile. Now, Sylvia referred to Deuteronomy 28, and I wrote this booklet, Deuteronomy 28, a key to understanding. And it's very important to understand what Deuteronomy 28 says. It says if Israel obeyed the law to a certain standard, I don't expect that God expected them to keep it perfectly, but if they kept it to a high enough standard, he would bless them with all sorts of blessings. But he said if they didn't, if they strayed, they would be judged or cursed. And if you look through those curses, they start off quite mild and they get um, more severe and more severe and more severe. And if Israel don't repent, the final judgment is to be sent into exile. And so this is what he is saying here in verse 27. I will send you into exile beyond Damascus. Number 17, please. So they're going to be taken beyond Damascus in 20 or 30 years, I believe it was. And Amos is talking then and not about the day of the Lord, which just precedes Christ's return. He's talking about a day of the Lord, which many of them will experience in their lifetime. And you can see there the yellow is the Syrian Empire, quite big. And you can see there's a little red dotted line starting from Israel going through Damascus and he said he was going to put them into exile beyond Damascus and it really was beyond Damascus because they went through Hamath, Gozan, Nineveh and out almost to the borders of Media and that's how far they were taken when the exile did come. Number 18 please. Now 60 plus 36 there's a difficult bit of math for you. I think it comes to 96. Do you agree if I got it right? I hope so, yes. Why have I put that there? Well, basically the word woe occurs 60 times in the Old Testament and 36 times in the New Testament. It's one of God's favorite words, woe to you. Yes. And of course, the classic one in the New Testament is Matthew 23, where we have woe to you Pharisees six times. But anyway, we're not dealing with the Pharisees today. We are dealing with Amos and we're dealing with the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes. And he says to them, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. And then he says again, a little later in chapter 6, verse 1, woe to you who are complacent in Zion. And to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Yes, they were a foremost nation. God had said that he would bless them, and he did. And as Sylvia pointed out, they were very wealthy. He had extended their borders. Absolutely fantastic. They were complacent. They felt secure. And the notable man, oh yes, look at what we've achieved. Really, you achieved it? Wasn't it God who did it for you? Wait, just wait, slide 19, please. So, woe to the complacent. So we should read what God says in Amos 6, 1 to 7. But I'm only going to note verse 7. You complacent, you will be among the first to go into exile. So you leaders, you are complacent, you'll be the first to go. And you may remember that first chapter of Daniel, after Nebuchadnezzar actually, or his troops, conquered Jerusalem and Judea, and they took into exile all the leaders and all the notable men and all the bright young people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Ebenezer. They took off the best. That was the first to go into exile. And this is what's going to happen to Israel also. You see, the Lord abhors the pride of Israel. You know, you were complacent. 
you thought you did it, did you? Well, you can read all about that in Amos 6, 8 to 14. And note verse 14. For the Lord God declares, I will stir up a nation against you, Israel, that will oppress you all the way from Libo Hamath to the Valley of the Arabah. Well, the Valley of the Arabah is another name for the Jordan Valley. There's some dispute about where Libo Hamath is. It's definitely on the western side of um, Israel. It's, and probably what he's saying here is, I, they will oppress you all the way from the Mediterranean to the Jordan Valley. So you who are complacent, you know, I will oppress you all. I'll stir up a nation against you. Now, it's interesting, the nation he's going to stir up against them are Syria. Now, Jonah went to them, went to Nineveh, the capital, told them they were going to be destroyed in 40 days. And what did they do? This pagan nation, they repented. They put on sackcloth and ashes, and so the God didn't destroy them. But what about this lot? What about Israel? Same type of message. Are they going to repent? Are they going to put on sackcloth and ashes? Next slide, please. Emmett, we now come to five visions of judgment. There's the vision of the locusts, chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. The vision of the fire, 7, verses 4 to 6. Vision of the plumb line, 7, 7 to 9. And then we interjected with a bit of opposition that Amos got from a guy called Amaziah. Then we have the vision of the summer fruit in 8, 1 to 14. And the vision of the stricken doors, 9, 1 to 10. Okay. Verse 20, next 21, please. So the locust, the flyer, and the plumb line, they all come in chapter 7, verses 1 to 9. You know, these, this is what you're going to be judged by. You're going to have locusts. You're going to have fire. I'll test you like a plumb line to see how straight you are. And he says in verse 9, the high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. Now, the high places, he refers to pagan altars. There's one there that somebody thinks is a high altar, a high place. It may be, I don't know, but you, in the Old Testament, God tells them when they build altars, they should not build them high and certainly not build them with steps going up to them. So God's altars were always simple things, down, if you like, at lower level. So the high places that were built for pagan worship, they're all going to be destroyed. And these sanctuaries that they had for all these idols, they're all going to be ruined. 22, please. Then Amos and Amaziah have a bit of an altercation about Jeroboam. You can read about it in Amos 10, 7 to 17. You see, in that section, Amos said, Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Well, did they respond like never? No, they didn't. And what was their attitude? Well, Amaziah said to Amos, get out, you seer, go back to the land of Judah. We don't want to listen to you. Get out, go home, go back home. But Amos was not deterred. He said, Ah, and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. So, you know, dear old Jonah, he didn't hardly say anything. He just said, you're going to be destroyed in 40 days. And they repented. Here's Amos going into all the details of their failings and what's God going to do. And this hard-hearted nation of Israel, this king and his priests and his prophets and this Amaziah, they had hardened their hearts, and they weren't going to listen. 23, please. And so you've got this basket of ripe fruit in Amos 8, 1 to 14. And in verse 3, he says, The Lord said to me, the time is ripe for my people. I will spare them no longer. Like a ripe fruit, I'm going to pluck them. But not pluck them off the tree to eat them. I'm going to pluck them out of their land. And then he talks about stricken lintels or doorposts or pillars in some, in, in some translations. And he's talking about these are the ones that support Israel. And I will shake the people of Israel from among all the nations. So the doorposts or the lintels or the pillars are all going to be shaken. And the whole edifice is going to collapse. 
Now note one, Amos preached about 760 to 753 BC. And Sylvia said the Lord gave them plenty of time because later Micah comes along and preaches to them and witnesses to them about 740 BC, you know, 15, 20 years later. And they weren't actually taken into exile by Assyria until about 722 BC. So they had stacks of time to repent and mend their ways. And they didn't. You know, two prophets were sent to them. This shows you what wealth and safety can do to people. You know, this nation was a rich nation. They had achieved so much thanks to the Lord, and yet it didn't have a good effect on them. 24, please. However, Amos doesn't leave it there. He talks about God is going to restore them. Talk about grace, dear oh me. She, the God is going to discipline them. He's going to send them, exile them far beyond Damascus. And yet in Amos 9, 11 to 15, he says, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins. And I will rebuild it as it used to be. And in 9.15, he says, I will plant Israel in their own land, says the Lord, your God. So under the Assyrian Empire, they were taken into exile. Eventually, the Babylonian Empire conquered the Syrian Empire. And as mentioned earlier, Babylon actually conquered Jerusalem and Judea and took them into exile. The Medo-Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire. And under the Medo-Persian Empire, they were allowed to return to the land. They were allowed to return home. They were even allowed to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. This is for Judah and also Jerusalem. So God certainly is gracious, isn't he? 25, please. Thank you, Will. Well, thanks very much, Mike. It's, uh, we've covered a lot of ground, haven't we, tonight? My goodness. Um, interesting, though, it's, after all the judgments that are pronounced on all the surrounding nations, the Lord turns his judgment on Israel itself. And Mike's explored some of the, the detail of that and how that's going to work out. These two big woe sections beginning there in Amos chapter 5, verse 18, and, and chapter 6, verse 1. Those who long for the day of the Lord, woe to them, because it's not going to be a day of light, as you would expect, but it's going to be a day of darkness. And woe to those who are complacent, proud, oppressing the poor. Interesting, this point that Mike made about the day of the Lord. Is it the day of the Lord? Is it our day of the Lord? How does this kind of thing work? And I, I think this happens with prophecy in a number of ways. You've got local fulfillments and then you've got ultimate fulfillments. You may have several local fulfillments before we come to the big one. For example, theologians down the centuries have debated who Antichrist is. Well, ooh, it's obviously Antiochus Epiphanes who came along in 170 BC and desecrated the temple. That's what the prophets are speaking about. Nope. It wasn't going to be him. What about AD 70 when again the temple was destroyed and desecrated? No, nope. he's an, an, an antichrist, but not the antichrist. The antichrist is still to come. And when he goes into the temple declaring himself to be God, the Lord Jesus will return and destroy him with the brightness of his coming, as Paul says. So we've got partial fulfillments and then an ultimate, ultimate fulfillment at the end. But the second woe is woe to those who are complacent, those who are proud, who are oppressing the poor. I think the Lord is always opposed to the proud, those who consider themselves to be superior to others, those who consider themselves to be beyond judgment. And even when we get to chapter nine in Amos, he's still talking about this. He says, all the sinners among my people will die by the sword. All those who say, disaster will not overtake or meet us. The many people you hear saying that, the many people were saying that before Putin moved into Ukraine. So it's a contemporary issue as well. People who live in luxury 
who think they are untouchable. But that, of course, is not the case. We've then got these five images of, of Israel's judgment coming. They're measured, they're found wanting, like, like Belshazzar, aren't they? Weighed in the balances, found wanting. They're like a basket of ripe fruit waiting to be devoured. So that was the situation that they were getting into. But I keep coming back to this idea, which Sylvia talked about as well, about those who oppress the poor and do not look after the needy. And I think as we read the Old Testament, you can see the Lord's uh, conditions for a just society as he sets out um, what Israel is to be like, the ideal Israel. He condemns the idle rich, those who oppress the poor, those who take advantage of the vulnerable, the widows and orphans, these are the ones he, he highlights because they were the most vulnerable people in that society. But we look at our own society, and the gap between rich and poor is growing. The demand for food banks is, is really escalating. More and more people are very likely to find themselves in serious food, fuel poverty. So what does the Lord expect of us? What does he expect of us? Micah, whom we're looking at uh, next time, talks about what does the Lord expect, for, uh, expect of you? Especially those of us who maybe are relatively well off. So real, this judgment was pronounced on Israel and they were exiled. The northern kingdom of Israel exiled, exiled into Assyria and then the southern kingdom exiled into Babylon. But fortunately, I think for Israel, the prophecy of Amos ends on a positive note, doesn't it? The exile is going to be overturned. The people will be brought back. They will be planted in their own land. Peace will be restored. David's throne will be restored. And the Prince of Peace, David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be reigning on it over the two houses of Israel, which will be joined together again. And that's the hope. And it's a sure and certain hope, and it is going to happen when he returns. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for our study tonight. We realize that you are a God of justice, a God with no desire for empty sacrifices and religious activity if vulnerable people are being oppressed and your people are not living as they should. You're a God who looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, you said to Samuel, but God looks on the heart. So Lord, we pray that you will open our eyes, that we can see aspects of the way we live that are not pleasing to you. And we pray that you will help us by your spirit to get our priorities right and to be the people that we should be in our, in our own very difficult society. So be with us, we ask you, and guide us, for we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.